morning, everyone. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. My name is Valerie Leonard. I am the founder of Nonprofit Utopia. We are with the Nonprofit Utopia live stream, and today we're partnering with Lever for Change. We have a very special edition today. We're going to be talking about lessons learned from the Bold Solutions Network, and our focus is really going beyond the competition. You know, we've heard a lot about what happens on the front end of the competition as to how we go through assessments and all of that good stuff. But today we're going to focus on, you know, what happens after the competition. We're going to be speaking with Kristen Molino, who heads up the Level for Change competitions, and then we will also hear from some of the contestants. So specifically, we're going to talk about how Lever for Change uses the Bold Solutions Network to build capacity and also how they use large competitions to address some of the world's largest or most pressing problems. And we have our contestants today for some of those contests to share some of their experiences. And you should know, too, that they represent a relatively broad continuum of experiences within the network. All right, so our guests today are Kristen Molino. She is the Vice President of Social Impact as well as a founding member for Lever for Change. And Lever for Change, as you may or may not know, is an affiliate of the MacArthur Foundation here in the city of Chicago. We also have Danny Laban. He is the Vice President for International Projects for the Sesame Workshop in New York City. And we also have Dr. Suda Kuriganti. She is a consultant for public health at Piramal Swastia in India. And last but certainly not least, we have Noah Mitchell. He is a managing director for Perscalis in their Columbus, Ohio office. And before we get started, we're going to ask each of them to come to us in their own way and share a little bit of background about themselves. And we will start with you, Kristen. Thanks, Valerie. Um, so yes, my name is Kristen Molino, and I'm the Vice President of Social Impact at Lever for Change, which is an affiliate organization of the MacArthur Foundation here in Chicago. And I've been at MacArthur for about eight years. My background is in um, education policy, and I first came to the foundation to work on a girls' secondary education program that, that was starting at the foundation and have since transitioned into um, helping to build and launch Lever for Change after finishing the the $100 million, 100 and change competition. So I'll, I'll leave it there, Valerie, and we can go on to the okay. next one. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Danny, and before Danny comes on, I, I want to encourage every one of you who is watching to post your name in the comments. Let us know where you're from, any experience you might have with large competitions or any of the competitions with Lever for Change. All righty. So Danny, where, where Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Danny Laban. I'm the Vice President of International Projects at Sesame Workshop. Sesame Workshop is the nonprofit organization that produces Sesame Street in the United States, but also around the world and has been doing that for more than 50 years now. Um, in my role at Sesame, I work to ensure that our content is adapted to meet local needs of children wherever we work and distributed across a wide network of partners. Um, Sesame Workshop was actually the inaugural winner of the first 100 and Change competition that was announced. Um, our win was announced in 2017. Um, and in partnership with the International Rescue Committee, we are creating the largest early childhood intervention in the history of humanitarian response, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit more about on the panel. Um, on an individual level, I also want to mention that I am a recent alumnus of the Bold Solution Network's professional development course um, that I took under the tutelage of Valerie Leonard. So I'm so excited to be here representing both Sesame and my experience uh, in the professional development course. Awesome. Awesome. All righty. So Dr. Suda. 
Yeah, hi all. Uh, myself, Sudha Kuruganti. I am a basically a dental surgeon and then did my master's in business management. I work as a consultant with Viramal Swastya Management and Research Institute. It's a not-for-profit public health organization based out of India. And uh, we started our journey in 2007 and we are one of the largest implementers of public health projects in the country. And I provide overall support for strategic planning for delivery of health services, designing new interventions, and also supporting partnerships. And we have been a part of Lever for Change MacArthur Foundation 100 and Change competition in 2019, and have been rated as one of the top 100 solutions that has potential to accelerate social impact. And that's how we got associated with Bold Solution Network. I'm really delighted to be here today and then look forward to the session ahead. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you. And Noah. Good morning, everybody. My name is Noah Mitchell, and um, I have the privilege of, uh, to serve as the managing director for Prescola's Columbus's campus here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, just a little bit about us and kind of how we are connected to uh, th this opportunity today. Uh, Prescola's is a national social change organization that works uh, to advance economic equity across America. Uh, we do this in a lot of different ways, but our primary way is by offering rigorous tuition-free technology training for adults who are traditionally underrepresented in the industry. And then we also do this really cool thing. Uh, not only do we train them, but then we connect them uh, with uh, employers for high growth careers. Um, we have this really cool stat that I'm so excited to share today is that we have nine, nine in 10 of our learners nationwide are people of color. Uh, more than a third identify as women and more than half uh, don't have an education credential beyond a high school diploma. And so at present, we, uh, we train in 17 different campuses from coast to coast, uh, but we are, and we've done about 3,000 diverse individual trainings this year. Uh, but what we're really excited about is that we have some ambitious goals, wow. uh, and thanks in large part to Lever for Change, the Economic Opportunity Challenge, and of course, uh, the Bold Solutions Network. And so we're excited about this dialogue and, and continue that conversation today. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So, Danny, let's hear about your experiences from 100 and Change. Great. Um, and I actually just, I want to say how exhilarating it is to be on this panel with leaders from different nonprofits in different spaces addressing different issues that aren't necessarily part of my day to day. And I really do think this is sort of a living testament to the power of the Bold Solutions Network. Um, so it's, it's just so exciting to be on this panel. Um, but back to the experience of Sesame and 100 and Change. Um, Sesame Street has really always been focused on how to deliver educational content to children who are most in need. And that was really the underpinning of Sesame Street's genesis more than 50 years ago in the United States about how to help prepare young children who did not have access to preschool so that they could arrive at preschool ready to learn with their peers who had had the advantage of attending um, some form of educational setting um, prior to elementary school. And internationally, we've been working in a very similar vein. Um, we've created localized versions of Sesame Street in more than 30 countries. And each of them really addresses the local needs of children in their own context through a bespoke curriculum and original characters who all reflect the everyday reality of those children. So we've had a lot of experience in this general space around media. Um, and it was really based on that history of ours and our mission and our vision for our social impact agenda going forward that we recognized just how horrific the displacement and migration issues um, were becoming um, as a result of the ongoing crisis in Syria. And we really, really believed that Sesame Street could have a role to play in helping to prevent an entire lost generation of children, of learners who had been displaced because of the conflict. And we were certain that we wanted to address it. We weren't exactly sure how. We also knew that we could not address it alone. Um, and so in 2016, at the World Humanitarian Summit that was held in Istanbul, we announced a partnership with the International Rescue Committee, really believing in the complementarity of our two organizations, that Sesame 
would bring a media-based solution that could scale and reach millions of children, but that working with a leading service provider like the IRC with a history of experience in humanitarian settings, that we would really be able to also address the needs of children in a very deep and personalized way on the ground. So we announced that partnership in 2016. It was beyond our absolute wildest dreams that there would even be such a thing as 100 and change. I don't believe the competition had even been announced, though it may have been in the minds of some people, Kristen, I don't know, um, when the idea actually sparked on your end. But we had no idea about it when we launched the partnership in 2016. Um, so here we are several years later, uh, four years actually into the program, which was funded as a five-year initiative, which will now extend beyond um, with all sorts of ancillary activities that um, I'd love to talk about. But basically, um, what 100 and Change enabled was the creation of a brand new Sesame Street initiative in the Middle East called Ahlan Simsim which means welcome Sesame. And um, it's so much more than a television program, though it does have at its heart a mass media initiative, which is how we've been able to reach more than 17 million children um, across 22 countries in less than four years, um, which really I think is a testament to the power of mass media to deliver in that type of way. Um, it's a multi-platform project, really drawing on multiple technologies and that has been especially helpful and urgent um, over the course of the last two years when we've needed to pivot to respond to the needs of COVID-19 and needed to adjust some of our delivery mechanisms and modalities of working directly with populations um, given the pandemic and everything that's meant for sort of working remotely and delivering services remotely. Um, but notwithstanding all of those changes, or in some ways maybe because technology has allowed us to do more than we had intended, we've reached at this point um, almost half a million children through direct services in partnership with the IRC. So it's been really thrilling. It's been quite a journey. Um, I do want to take a few seconds to just introduce the characters who you might see behind me in the virtual background. These are our new Muppets. Hopefully you can see them there, yeah. Um, yes. have, can you see them? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. So we have Jad and Basma and Mezuzah, who's the goat. Um, <laughs> and all three characters along with some of the classic Sesame Street characters like Elmo and Cookie Monster and Grover um, are part of the initiative. But really Basma and Jad in particular are vehicles for modeling acceptance coping, resilience, for really being spokes Muppets, if you will, for the educational curriculum, um, and really also modeling the dynamic between refugee children and the host community in ways that are, of course, child appropriate, um, and that we've been working on um, each season to refine with various advisors um, and experts um, in multiple fields that are related, from child development to psychology to early childhood education. So. Um, there's so much, um, but maybe I'll pause there. I know we have more questions and um, okay. more to say. Well, awesome, awesome. Yeah, one of the things that I really like about the Lever for Change con contest is the fact that every point in the process, it, there's an opportunity for you to build your organizational capacity. You know, from the start, you know, you, you fill out an application, the first thing you have to do is assess your capacity. And then again, at every other point, there's opportunity. We want to get a really good sense for people's experiences with large scale competitions. And we want to hear from Kristen and have her give us a little bit of background as to Lever for Change's work with large competitions. Great. Thanks, Valerie. So <clears throat> I'll give a little bit of background to Lever for Change, which is an organization focused on unlocking significant philanthropic capital and accelerating positive social change around some of the world's biggest challenges. Uh, we do this through two two key activities. One, which we've talked about previously on Nonprofit Utopia, I think with your conversations with Cecilia Conrad, 
which is that we run customized competitions that help donors identify organizations and projects ready for a $10 million or greater investment. Um, and for donors who want to move more quickly, because a competition can take anywhere from a year to about 18 months to go from the very beginning design phases all the way to execution and selecting award recipients. So for do some donors, they want to move more quickly. <clears throat> and so for that, we've created what we call our Bold Solutions Network, which is an inclusive network of our most highly rated projects that have been vetted and been through our competition process and are ready to receive capital and get to work to really... Um, create social change around the issues that they care about most. So the concept for Lever for Change really fell out of our success with creating and running the MacArthur Foundation's $100 million grant competition, 100 a Change, which Danny and I both referred to. So we really set out originally with that competition to build an open and transparent process to create an opportunity for organizations to define and the problem and solution and to create a process that would provide value add to all who applied not just the ultimate award recipient and really this model was built on <clears throat> the idea that philanthropy often gets a lot of criticism for it setting an agenda <laughs> the strategy, it sets the problem, and then it goes out and it looks for nonprofits who can who can kind of help fulfill the strategy goals of the foundation. And we wanted to turn that on its head and rather than uh, define the problem and solution, ask nonprofits around the globe, what are the pressing issues that you're working on and what are the solutions that you have found are impactful and are working within the space your work is uh, focused. And so that was really the impetus for the first round of 100 and change. We had no idea how successful it was going to be or if it would be successful, but um, we actually kind of found out we were incredibly successful on, on multiple in multiple ways. So what we had originally set out to do, which was to find a problem and solution that maybe we didn't know about or that we needed to focus on as the philanthropic community, that was one um, one success that we had in, in the fact that we, uh, as Danny said, we ended up funding Sesame Workshop and the International Rescue Committee to, uh, to specifically focus on how to support the youngest refugees, the youngest and most vulnerable population of zero to six year olds in the Syrian response region who often are completely left out of the humanitarian response, right? Everything is focused on parents, adults, and children that are in school, but there was this population that was kind of languishing and not getting a lot of attention. So our selection of Sesame and IRC really uh, shone a spotlight on what uh, on, a, on an area that was really underfunded by the philanthropic community. It was an area where we needed to really think about how are we supporting these youngest and most vulnerable people. So that was one thing that the competition led to. But the other thing was that we, we did not realize exactly how other donors would respond to MacArthur creating and running a challenge and deciding to fund $100 million worth of funding into a specific organization doing a specific set of work. So what we ended up finding out was that it was an incredibly powerful model. So with MacArthur's initial investment of $100 million, and then they also invested $15 million each into the other three finalists of that competition. So in total, it was a $145 million investment. With that initial investment in 2018, we actually have converted that into catalyzing over $415 million to date for the first round of 100 and change applicants. So that includes the finalists, it includes the semi-finalists that were part of that competition, and it includes about the top 100 or top 200 organizations that we continue to promote and kind of get the word out about, right? Those organizations, some of those organizations re, re, uh, receive funding as well. So we catalyzed over $450 million. And, and we also had a whole bunch of donors who were coming to us saying, oh, we have programs in you know, health. What did you get in the health sector? Or we, had pro we have programs working on education specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa. Did you get any good proposals in that area? And so we started to wonder, was this a model that we could use to kind of catalyze funders to give big, but also use the data, the proposals, the work that, that all these organizations did to elevate them further and to amplify their work and to take the hard work that they'd already done to participate and convert that into you know, 
uh, into real dollars through through these different types of donors. So we were really excited about that and decided to launch Lever for Change with the mission to unlock that capital and continue to catalyze the competition model um, to build on and, and uh, hopefully fund organizations over time. So since we've launched Lever for Change in 2019, we've run eight competitions. We now have gone from, I think, about uh, 10 organizations in our Bold Solution Network to 140 top ranked proposals in our Bold Solution Network. And to date, we've catalyzed over $800 million uh, in funding with a goal of unlocking $1 billion by 2023. So that's our, our goal. And we're well on our way to reaching our goal by 2023. Hopefully we'll reach it sooner. Uh, so that's what Lever for Change is trying to do and, and where we are right now. <clears throat> that is absolutely amazing. So, Dr. Suda, we want to put you on the spot and have you let us know a little bit about your experiences in the application process. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Valerie. Uh, just to give an overview, Swastia implements several healthcare innovations at scale, and we have projects across 21 states in the country and uh, touched over 120 plus million people so far. And largely, we work in partnerships with governments, corporates, and many international foundations, including Bills and Melinda Gates, Rockefeller, USAID supports us, and many of our programs. So the program model that we have proposed uh, to Liver for Change was an uh, exclusive tribal one, a sustainable action to redefine tribal health in India, reaching to around 40 million tribal people uh, who are most vulnerable in terms of health outcomes and many lives in the tribal are lost due to causes which are actually preventable and that happens due to lack of availability and accessibility to basic health care. So the, propo the proposed solution was to address both demand and supply side constraints of public health ecosystem ensuring last mile delivery of uh, primary health care and the idea is to transform the way tribal people seek and receive health care in India. So coming to the application part, it was a great experience making submission uh, to the 100 and change grant. And we had uh, some very, very valuable feedback on the application that we uh, you know, received from technical expert committee, the peer reviewers, the judging panel. And I think that's the best part of Liver for Change competitions as they care to share genuine feedback on your proposal, which is very, very crucial. And it actually helps you understand how to improve on your model, where where, where are the gaps, and I you know how uh, best can you bring out your model. So uh, also in the organization, from our uh, part, we have a dedicated grants team, you know, which as a part of a process analyzes all the feedbacks and comments we receive from funders, you know, on the suggested areas for improvement. And we clearly come out with a plan of action uh, that happens with every submission that we make in a very systematic manner. And these learnings uh, have actually enabled us to have a lot of winning proposals in recent times. So uh, at the time of application, which was like in 2019, it was a healthcare delivery kind of a model with community engagement and health system strengthening components. But the organization vision was to make it a nationwide platform. And I'm uh, really, really glad to share that the initiative has now evolved as a multi-stakeholder initiative in partnership with Ministry of Tribal Affairs and Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India, supported by Premal Swastya and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have launched this project on World Health Day this year. And it is for enhancing health and nutrition ecosystem as such for the tribal communities. And we aim to end preventable deaths among tribal populations, over 100 million people by converging efforts of various stakeholders. So, uh, yeah, thank you. OK, great. That is awesome. Awesome. And then Noah, uh, Perscolis won $10 million in the Economic Opportunity Challenge for Workforce Development. Can you tell us a little bit more about your program and and the model that you used absolutely um so uh, the the economic opportunity challenge uh and lever for change uh really really kind of challenge us to uh to embrace a much more ambitious impact goal than we had ever really considered in our history um and it's ironic that this took place uh in 2020 uh, <laughs> while we were also uh, experiencing a, a global pandemic, but it was really important for us because we uh, we understood that those that were that were largely impacted by the global pandemic uh, were the people that we served, uh, people of color, uh, women, uh, those who were underserved, uh, and so going through the economic opportunity challenge, uh, this was really a defining moment um, 
that really made uh, all of us at Prescolas realize how uh, important it was for us to, uh, to, to embark upon this journey now. Um, it was ambitious. And in terms of um, what we were trying to do, um, in some ways was a little bit crazy. Um, but I think that change uh, happens sometimes in the crazy. Uh, and so we, uh, we, we decided to, uh, to, to, to do some things that were a little bit challenging. Um, mm -hmm. We actually believe here at Prescola that it's unacceptable that 44% of workers earn less than $15 an hour. And wow. that that percentage of low rate wage actually is even worse uh, in the communities that we serve, uh, people of color uh, and women. So going through the economic opportunity challenge um, was really a defining moment for us. In regards to our um, our actual program and how we go about that, our proven pathways uh, to transform motive uh, careers in tech program, uh, this model is really bent, built with the insight and learnings um, that we have, uh, external evaluations, rigorous data, informed decision making, all that paired with our commitment uh, to close this uh, gap that we have in America, uh, this opportunity gap, uh, specifically the opportunity gap in technology. So our model aims to uh, scale our training opportunities um, to 25 cities by 2025. You heard me wow. right. Wow. Cities, uh, by 2025. Um, and that will take us uh, to training about 10,000 individuals traditionally uh, throughout a year. So uh, we're on track to train 3,017 cities this year. Mm -hmm. um, but we are looking to increase that uh, growth exponentially uh, as we get to 2025, where we'll be in 25 cities now. Okay, Noah, can I stop you, um, you for just be. a minute? Yeah, sure. when I heard that huge number for scale, it occurred to me that that scale may not necessarily be possible, but for Lever for Change, the, the Lever for Change Award. Is, is that oh, true? absolutely, 100% true. And so I think um, not only is our, um, our goal bold, uh, and transformative, and I think that it um, it brings about systemic change, um, but it's it's not possible without without um, labor for change and the work that we're uh, that we've gotten from from you all. And so we are um, we will say that it positioned us to really uh, to to be more bold and to be more mm -hmm. ambitious. And so that that's a hundred percent true value. Thank you for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that that's amazing. You know, because I think when we look at organic growth, it's typically linear. But now that you've gotten, you know, that injection of capital, you know, you're just able to do so much more, so much quicker, it sounds. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Did you have other comments to share? I think, okay. I think that's, that's all for that one. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Did any of our panelists have any questions of one another based on what you've heard so far? Any questions or comments? And again, we encourage those of you who are in our audience, if you have any questions, any comments, any experiences, please post. All right, Kelly. All right. And Catherine, thank you. Thank you, ladies, for you know stopping in and letting us know what you're here to learn. You're here to learn more about. OK, can you post that again, Emerson? Okay, she's here to learn more about the importance of increasing education across the globe. Thank you for your hard work. All right, before we transition to the next section, did anyone have any comments about, you know, the importance of increasing education across the globe based on your experiences? And you don't necessarily have to work internationally to respond. Okay. All righty. So at this point, we're going to be focusing on the contestants and what they were able to do, you know, to leverage those gifts, so to speak, from the contest, right? And we're also going to be looking at how they were able to not only increase their organizational capacity, but as you've already heard from Noah, um, they've been able to scale in ways that would not necessarily be possible in so short a time, but for the grace of God and these gifts. So before we do that, I just want to remind Kristen, you know, that she and I were talking the other day and she says, you know, regardless 
of whether or not people win the grand prize. Everyone is a winner, right? And I just want to have Kristen come to us in her own way and kind of expound on some of those examples of how people have actually won, even though they did not get the grand prize. Yeah, thanks, Valerie. Yeah, to the to your point and to Dr. Suda's point and Noah's point and Danny's point, um, you know, our work with Lever for Change has really been focused on making sure that we bring value add to all of the participants. And that starts at the very beginning of the competition. So from the time that organizations start to make a decision if they want to uh, to participate in a competition, we put everything online. We make it very clear what the process is and what you will need to do in order to participate. We put the whole application online and we try and streamline that as much as possible. We created an organizational readiness tool so that teams can fill that out and make a decision. Is it worth our time to apply? Do we think we'll be competitive or not competitive? So we try and do as much as possible upfront to make sure that people are coming into the process, uh, knowing what it's going to entail, as well as making a decision as to whether or not it's the right fit for them and their organization. The second thing we do is, is something that Dr. Suda pointed to, which is we ensure that every organization receives feedback in our process. So regardless of how far you go in the process, at each step you're receiving some type of feedback Sometimes it's peer feedback that's saying, here are things that I didn't understand, or here are things that could strengthen. Or sometimes it's, hey, we want to partner with you because we do similar work and we would love to reach out, you know, regardless of this competition and find ways to potentially partner together. We also use um, expert panelists and judges from around the globe who have expertise in, air, in specific areas of work to provide feedback on proposals. And again, sometimes it's you know, asking for more clarity or probing organizations and pushing organizations to go a little bit deeper or think differently about their work. So the, the feedback can range across the different competitions based on whatever criteria was set out at the beginning of the competition, which is another thing we make very clear upfront. Here's what you will be judged on and what your proposal will be judged on so that organizations know how to think about putting, putting their application forward in the strongest way possible. And then as organizations continue to go through our process um, and are named finalists, that's where we we really start to try as, and add as much value at as possible. We've continued to tweak our model and build our model with the feedback of all of the organizations sitting here with us today. Um, you know, that feedback has helped us to continue to build a better, a better process and to continue to build out how we support organizations, both in the competition and beyond. So once a, an organization becomes a finalist, they receive one-on-one -on -one tailored technical support from technical advisors, uh, depending on where they're located. You know, it's either a global technical advisor or uh, a technical advisor based here in the United States. They receive uh, support to create a strong written um, proposal that they submit at the end of the process that then is evaluated by the donors. And then there's an ultimate decision on who will receive funding. But also at the time that organizations become finalists, that's when they become part of our Bold Solution Network. And that is when they will initially begin to get access to all the things that we offer to the Bold Solution Network, including you know access to fundraising workshops and fundraising support or stra strategic design or um, how do you build a contact management system, right? There's all different types of things that we offer to help organizations continue to grow and support them in their journey. And then at the same time, once they become finalists, we immediately start working to elevate their proposals to other donors in the hopes of catalyzing additional funding. And as I pointed out in the initial round of 100 and Change, we had a lot of success with that. Organizations that ended up receiving, um, well, Organizations that received $15 million from, from the MacArthur Foundation were able to convert that into matching grants from other foundations. Sesame uh, Workshop actually received a $100 million grant from the Lego Foundation um, as, part of the, the, as part of their work to expand working with refugees into other regions and other contexts, right? So organizations have been able to take those grants and convert them into additional funding. Um, and so we also recognize, however, that Fundraising takes a long time, as any of the nonprofits around the table here can say, uh, and development officers that work in the nonprofit sector know it can take a year or longer to kind of cultivate those relationships, build on those relationships, and have them turn into funding. And so we have built the Bold Solution Network to really catalyze funding using the long tail of the competition. Um, as a way to elevate the, this work, right? So work, as I said earlier, we're constantly sharing proposals. We're constantly trying to get donors 
interested, excited about the work of our Bold Solution Network members in the hopes that that will translate into funding, but it takes time. So we have committed to working with the Bold Solution Network members for two years at a minimum. And in some cases, we likely will continue that relationship because we want to continue to have a pool of organizations ready to absorb this capital, ready to go out and hit the ground running if a donor comes to us and says, we're ready to commit significant resources to help move this social change forward. So that's how we continue to support the organizations. And I think probably the, the teams around the table can better better speak to whether or not that's been helpful, useful, and, and in what ways that has come to fruition within their own organizations. Oh, that's awesome. And before we bring on Dr. Suda, I am just curious. I want to make sure I heard right. Sesame Workshop won $100 million mm -hmm. originally, right, through the 100 and change. And then they leveraged it with another $100 million. Did I, did I hear that right? Yes. So we, you know, part of... Part of what we've, we, this was part of the success of the first round of 100 and change where we received uh, a call from Lego saying we're interested, you know, we are inspired by what MacArthur is doing. Our board also wants to be giving bigger than what we're doing. This has inspired them to move and to move quickly. You know, we're thinking about giving a matching $100 million gift. We have a longstanding relationship with Sesame, but what did you learn about, about this work through the process? Is there information you can share? Is there any due diligence? Is there, you know, what, what kind of insights do you have on the team and the work um, in this refugee context, which we as an organization have been wanting to move into that space, but we're a we've been a little bit uncertain about how to best do it. So we had some of those background conversations at the same time that Sesame was also having conversations with Lego. And ultimately that translated into Lego Foundation matching um, MacArthur's $100 million grant. I, it, it's th That grant was to support some additional work in the Syrian response region that the MacArthur Foundation's initial $100 million grant went to mm -hmm. fund and then also to expand their work into uh, Bangladesh supporting the Rohingya population um, with a similar model, but with a different partner instead of with IRC working with BRAC. So um, it was exciting because part of what we were hoping with that initial $100 million commitment is that we would shine a, shine a spotlight on an area that was considerably under-resourced. Um, I think at the time, there was, there was less than 2% of humanitarian funding that was going to education, and it was like less than 1.1% of that, Danny might have the numbers off the top of his head, it's been a couple of years now, but um, it was going to support the earliest years, right? It was all going to kind of primary school, secondary school age kids. So it was a real opportunity for us to shine a spotlight on that. And Lego Foundation said, yes, we're in, we also wanna shine a spotlight on this, but we're, we wanna take this model and see if it can be replicated and adapted to a different context. And so that's how that funding kind of came to fruition over time. Okay, awesome, awesome. So with that, Danny, can you give us some insight, you know, what it's like to be on the receiving end of $100 million, at another $100 million? What sure, um, and I think really, you know, in addition to that additional $100 million helping to expand the work in the Middle East and to address the refugee crisis um, in Bangladesh with those who've, uh, the Rohingya population, who migrated from Myanmar, um, both of which you mentioned, Kristen. But I also think what that additional $100 million did speaks a lot to the comment um, that one of the viewers mentioned in the chat box around sort of the need for global education everywhere. Because I think really the ultimate objective for us of this mega grant combined with another mega grant was trying and still is trying, because we're, we're still deep in it, um, to create a model for the delivery of early childhood development and education in humanitarian settings, irrespective of the specific crisis or conflict setting. Um, and that doesn't mean that we are not taking into account the specifics of the conflict and crisis setting, because those are obviously very important in terms of how they impact children, mm -hmm. but to create a model that is able to be deployed very quickly um, in current and then future settings and crises for children. Um, and, you know, it doesn't take more than looking at um, any daily website of the news to understand 
that these crises um, come fast and furious. So um, we're really looking at being able to have that agility. And I think um, that's really sort of the crux of what we're driving toward now is what are those models and how do we use them um, to, to impact children everywhere who are affected by conflict and crisis. Um, so that's um, sort of a, a mega goal of these mm -hmm. mega projects. Um, I also do want to, you know, because Kristen, you've mentioned a few times this notion of shining a spotlight on the issue. And that in some ways um, has both tangible and intangible elements. Um, we really have been using the work that we're doing to help highlight the need for education for young children um, and really using it to advance the issue, um, no less in some ways even more than the work itself. Um, and we've been able to sort of mobilize attention around this issue in global forums like the Global Refugee um, Forum just before the onset of COVID, um, where we really shine that spotlight on the needs of ECD mm -hmm. in humanitarian work. Um, and we're working with various UN agencies and through different coalitions of NGOs in the space to really be leaders and to use the Muppets as trusted vehicles, not just for children, of course, but also for adults. Because um, we found that the Muppet characters, Basma Jad, Mezuzah, and all their friends are really able to bring to people's attention tough topics that um, might be sensitive or controversial, but when they're delivered carefully through um, a Muppet, um, they, they resonate in a different way and sometimes cut through some of the resistance. So, you know, we've been really experimenting with how we're uniquely leveraged to do that um, in different ways. Okay, awesome, awesome. All right, Dr. Suda, you have been working with some of the partners within the Bowl Solutions Network, you know, one of which is Nonprofit Utopia, but you've also have taken advantage of some other consulting opportunities to help strengthen capacity. So can you give us a little bit of, um, give us some of your, I guess, impressions, share some of your experiences with some of that work and how it's been helpful in terms of you know building capacity for you. Certainly, thank you, thank you, Valerie. Yeah, as uh, Kristen was rightly mentioning, funding is only one part of the competition. As a part of BSN member, we could access several of opportunities. And thanks to Live for Change again, uh, we over a year engagement or with some we still continue to have uh, with many impact partners like Sattva Consulting in India, Not for Profit Utopia with you, Valerie, and then Imago, Catch a Fire Platform, you know, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. uh, with Sattva Consulting, we had customized one-on-one uh, -on -one advisory support wherein we identified certain priority areas as per organization requirement, you know, where we needed some improvement. And then they supported us uh, in, in areas like partnership strategy, fundraising, and also they held uh, several capacity building workshops for our teams along with other cohorts uh, in communication, uh, branding, social media, uh, you know, and many more. And with Valerie, not for profit, it was an awesome experience. Not to flatter you, Valerie, but uh, <laughs> you did I'll great building <laughs> workshops uh, for many of our team members. And uh, it was a deep dive in areas like community needs assessment and theory of change, proposal writing, evaluation planning, and models of collaboration. Where you know all these things greatly helped us build organization capacities and strengthen our models. And uh, believe me, you know, putting in an uh, entire story in 100 or 200 words in an application is just not an easy job. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> app and we're still learning it. Uh, so we still reach out to Valerie uh, after her stipulated time of, you know, these capacity building workshops and with our requirement. And she is so kind to oblige them every time we approach. And I must say, this is the kind of people and organizations LFC has connected us with. Thank you so very much. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure working with you guys. And Noah, um, one of the things that I find to be most challenging, and I think that many other organizations find to be challenging, especially when you're working on large projects, is putting together a cohesive collaborative, right? 
where there's accountability, there you're looking for um, people who are compatible and all of that good stuff. But then there's also the project management component. So we'd be really, really interested in hearing how you guys at Proscalis, you know, went about, you know, selecting your team, holding them accountable, and then you also are using those same people to build scale. And I can imagine it's even more challenging keeping the project on track, but you guys are slated to meet your goals, if not on time, then ahead of time. So we'd love to hear how you guys are doing that. Well, Valerie, thank you. That's such, that's such a good question. Um, and so um, I know that I'm probably a little bit biased here, uh, <laughs> but I really believe that um, my Perscolis colleagues um, across uh, the nation are some of the be very best. Uh, they are tenaciously committed uh, to equity and making uh, real change. And so that that makes the job in and of itself a little bit um, a little bit easier. Um, I know that nearly everyone uh, of my colleagues are are part of the process of us you know being successful. And so whether it's supporting a learner enrolled um, in our latest software engineering class in uh, Dallas or creating connections with an employee partner in Newark or creating our, our next learner pipeline for our IT support class in Seattle. Uh, we really believe that collaboration and working together is one of the keys to our success. So with that, that re really helps us to, to really process what it looks like for us to come together and, and come up with a plan for how we, uh, how we go about this. We don't think that we're doing this work single handedly. It's not in isolation. It's not um, even uh, based on our specific campuses, but we're doing this work together. Um, we, we, as we, so I've, as we built this model, we're building this out. We, uh, we also knew that we needed to have some partners that were external that were be helping us to really process uh, how we go about that. And so some of those partners have included uh, MDRC uh, and the financial clinic. Uh, they, they have been a really key to, key to our uh, long-term success. Um, we, we believe that as we're processing this, we've been, been able to come up with a, uh, a strategic strategy that kind of helps us to do some of those things that you, uh, that you talked about, uh, Valerie. Uh, first is that we, uh, we want to grow uh, our enrollment uh, to more than 5,000 learners a year while continuing wow. to achieve our national standards. And this is the key. It's not just about the growth, but it's also maintaining the quality of what we're doing. So we still believe that we should be graduating 85% of those learners. So it's not just yeah. about putting people through the pipeline, but it's about making sure that we're equipping them to be successful and to finish what they started. Uh, and then also uh, placing 80% of those into jobs so that they are not just having um, a living wage, but a thriving wage uh, within a career. So that is, that's first and foremost for us. The second is um, making sure that we are combining our services uh, with the financial clinics, uh, evidence-based um, financial mobility strategies. And so connecting them to make sure that not, not only are we, uh, are we helping people to get uh, careers, but then we're also helping them to process what to do with that, uh, with, those, with, those, with those finances and, and how to live uh, a thriving life. Um, and third, uh, we are uh, expanding our existing partnerships with uh, MDRC uh, to use data science to target our work to effectively uh, make sure that we're generating a knowledge base um, plans of actions to, to really impact our field of IT. So we, we really are, are committed to those things. Um, I would say that we have identified uh, an achievable level of scale uh, that can benefit um, the economic development of our entire uh, cities, our regions, and, and we, we really think we can even uh, impact uh, our whole nation. Um, this is important. It's important work that we're mm -hmm. doing. Um, it's important, it's, especially as we're even embarking upon this during the pandemic, because as I mentioned earlier, we know that the pandemic um, impacted uh, people of color uh, and women uh, in a way that is, is really uh, really powerful, and we, we want to be part of that solution. Uh, we also uh, uh, will be part participating in uh, a thing called Strengthening the Executive Team, uh, which is a bridge span leadership accelerator program uh, that is offered through LFC. And we'll be doing that starting this spring. The reason why we're doing that, and this actually really, really speaks to the heart of your question too, uh, is that we, we just believe that as you are leading uh, a scaling organization, this really, really requires that you that you build out your leadership both nationally and locally and so we want to make sure that we're investing in our people and making sure that they uh they have the skills that they need uh as we're building out 
uh, and scaling this organization in a way that we've never done before. Um, we really believe that with our commitment to this um, and uh, our, our commitment to this project and our aligned goals, uh, that we can stay accountable to one another. Uh, we, we've set up those those um, those infrastructures to make sure that's happening. Um, we also believe in effective project management, consistent meet, consistent meetings, team calls, and more. So we we have a multifaceted way that we that we that we try to go about making sure that everybody has what they need to be successful, and that we're holding people accountable to uh, for this important work. Okay, excellent. We have all of five minutes left in our regularly scheduled time. And Kristen, I know you have a hard stop at five. I'm, I'm sorry, in five minutes. So we have. I want to start with you. Um, are there any lessons learned that you'd like to share? Uh, so many lessons learned. Um, I think we've, we've learned a lot since we've run our first 100 and change competition and even a lot from since we ran the um, economic opportunity challenge. And thanks to Noah and his team and the other finalists for giving us feedback and telling us what worked and what didn't about the mm -hmm. process. So we've continued to refine what we what we offer to organizations, how we support them during the finalist process, what we ask of them to do in the competition process in order to make sure that what we're asking aligns both with what the donor needs, but also is not overburdening the organizations that are going through the process. Um, we have tried to start instituting um, planning grants to support organizations who are going through the process so that they are supported financially and recognizing that they all have day jobs, right? So they're going through this process in order to, to um, you know, be a finalist in a competition and they need to work on their proposal. But at the same time, they're still trying to do all this amazing work that, that everybody on this call has been talking about. We don't want to take away from that. Um, too much, right? So, so we've 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 definitely been continuing to build and hone the process, streamline our processes in order to make it more, you know, just more value additive, less of a burden, and and make sure that we're helping to amplify organizations. And also, Lever for Change has been building since this all started, right? Um, I think in the Economic Opportunity Challenge, we were probably about a staff of five or six people and we've grown to almost 20 now. So, wow. you know, with all of those additional people, you know, to Noah's point, we're continuing to build our own internal capacity, build different, you know, get different perspectives, different ideas on how we can continue to do things and, and be a stronger organization to support all these organizations. So a lot of learnings and it's been a really exciting journey. And we, we thank all of the organizations that have uh, on this call that have been through it with us and provided feedback and honest feedback, which is, you know, often difficult for organizations to feel it open to doing, but we've really appreciated that feedback and, you know, just continuing to try and improve what we're doing and what we're offering. Okay. And before you go, what's next and how can people contact you? Great. So what's next is my uh, my fantastic staff has been working to really build on what we've been offering over the last couple of years. So we will have some continued themes of offerings that we've done previously and that have been um, really popular. So specifically how to effectively market your projects and your missions and your organization, support with um, I'm sorry, uh, stuff that we've done before is like continued with diversity, equity, and inclusion, mm -hmm. continued leadership development and leadership cultivation up, uh, uh, support, and then continued organizational strategy. Some things that we're going to offer that are new in the upcoming years, I reversed those, so I apologize, That's is that okay. we're going to be um, offering some things on effectively marketing members' missions and their projects and their teams in ways that are compelling. Um, support for monitoring and evaluation. We've heard from a lot of organizations that that's an area where they could use some additional support and, and help. And then also financial capitalization and planning. So again, for organizations who now have, have a big influx of money, like per school is $10 million, how do you take that? How do you continue to capitalize on it? How do you plan? How are you thinking about fundraising long-term while you have that funding? Because we've heard from organizations, the donors will say, oh, you just got $10 million. Do you really need additional funding, right? So how do you kind of take that and, and use it as a leverage point as opposed to it, it being a detriment to your fundraising strategy? And then we also want to continue to highlight and strengthen the connections between our network members. So we will do targeted engagement. We have some collaborative opportunities available through a small grant fund, which is our SWIFT grants. And then we're continuing to create spaces 
for members to lead other members. Um, so there's a lot of expertise within our network. So how do we capitalize on the expertise and allow and provide opportunities for network members to learn from one another? So that's what's on the horizon. And um, it's a lot of good stuff. And we're really excited to kick off 2022. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I know you got a hard stop and you got another meeting to go to. All righty. So Danny, let's hear from you. What are some of yeah, what are some of the learnings that you've had, some of the lessons learned, as well as what advice might you give to other people who want to quote unquote do this at home? Great. Um, well, it was great to hear from Kristen that the process is being streamlined in um, some ways. It is not for the faint of heart. Um, there, it's a very um, involved process with a lot of support along the way, but we were so deeply engaged in various steps of the competition that stretched out for almost a year. Um, that said, I would encourage any organization that has the internal bandwidth and has the conviction in the issue that they're addressing to submit and apply and compete because the exposure both for the organization as well as for the issue itself is absolutely invaluable um and you know not to mention of course the the value that it could have if one is the winner but really the, the sort of invaluable um exposure that comes with it um exposure on every level and also you know to everything else that lever for change offers um those who are part of the the network um if you will so i i would just um really encourage organizations who deeply believe in what they're doing to think about it and um i would also advise that organizations should think really deeply and clearly about what the implications are of such an injection of resources so quickly and what that means for the growth of an organization, for the other strategic priorities of an organization that um, may not necessarily be part of the clear agenda um, of the proposal and the issue at hand, because organizations, of course, work on multiple issues. So really to be thoughtful and to prepare for what that will look like. I mean, in some ways, it's impossible to totally prepare because $10 million, $100 million, like these are such huge sums of money um, mm -hmm. that are not sort of the usual for what we, we fundraise. But um, I don't think I can underestimate the importance of that long-term planning um, and really growing responsibly um, when, that, when, when that grant money comes, uh, you know, whatever the size, but especially with these types of sums. Um, so yeah, that would be, that would be my advice um, okay. on the organizations. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Noah, what advice would you give to other people who want to try this at home? that's a really good question um I, I think that as i reflect over you know the last 12 months for us as an organization there's been some um some major wins and uh, there's been a lot of uh, gifts from foundations and corporations and individuals um that have uh, but there's also been a lot of growing pains uh I, it was just mentioned by danny you know um, the need to really sit back and process like what an injection of this type of uh, money and exposure and networking uh, can really do for an organization. And so um, I think that um, one of the things I would underscore is the need to be nimble and flexible, uh, especially um, as we have for us, particularly, we're having, you know, some significant growth and scale. Uh, and even though you have plans in place, change uh, demands intention uh, and constant flexibility. And so uh, I think that, that that's a big part. But to to your to your main question, what I would leave uh, as a um, as a piece of encouragement is really simple but profound, and it is to be bold. Uh, now more than ever uh, is a time to ensure equitable recovery of our nation and our world, uh, and we need to continue 
uh, to be bold. As we are uh, grappling with the impact of the pandemic, we, we need bold solutions uh, and, and we need to rethink uh, the way that we are working uh, and the way that we can build effective teams and the way that we can define success. Uh, success, we need, to, uh, we need to be bold. We can't make change alone. And so we have to, uh, you, have to, uh, you have to go out and be bold. And so uh, that, that would be what I would leave for folks. Um, if you're pursuing, pursuing a big bet, uh, it, it takes courage and it takes the willingness to think uh, of your organization and what you can achieve uh, if things were, uh, were, were a little bit different. So uh, be bold. Um, they've put this on the banner, but uh, if you want to learn more about Prescolis, you can uh, go to our website at prescolis.org. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Noah Mitchell, and I believe they had my email scrolling through there as well, uh, in Mitchell uh, at prescolis.org. Okay, awesome. All righty, last but not least, Dr. Suda, what would you leave with our viewers? So I, I would like to actually uh, say it's a big thank you to Utopia and River for Change for this awesome discussion today, uh, very insightful. And thanks to all Impact Partners here for sharing their learnings or experience that I can take back. And uh, for more information on our programs or if you'd be interested to be a part of our initiative, please reach out and uh, my contact email is on, uh, on the screen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to say thank you to our panelists, especially for staying over time, especially when I know they're pressing obligations. And I also want to say thank you to those of you who have taken time to view us you know, before you start your work day in earnest. Some of you are taking a break, actually. And at any rate, we're going to have this video um, edit it and hopefully run on Can TV. But in the meantime, you could still catch the raw video on YouTube. And if there are any questions or comments that you need to follow up on, we have contact information in the chat box. And if there are any questions that you might have, speak now or forever hold your peace because we're getting ready to go. All righty. So again, I want to thank our panelists for joining us and making this such a wonderful discussion. All right, we take care. Thank you, Valerie. All righty. Thank you. You're quite welcome.